Oh, come on. Uh, Galatians 6, we were dealing with personal, the, the personal responsibility of, of each individual Christian to reach out and be a help and a blessing to others, but also the personal responsibility of the, uh, of, of the individual who needs the help. Uh, there is a dual responsibility there. And uh, we talked a little bit about David Lipscomb and about uh, the opportunities that we had. And then Paul continues on in, from verses 6 through 10. He says, let the one who is taught. Now, this is, the, this is the logical conclusion. If we're going to be a blessing and a help to somebody, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he also will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from to the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows from the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So, a lot there. And there's a lot to unpack in, in Galatians 6. And so... When you begin looking at verse 6, all of us who have been taught should be willing to share and teach others. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do it in, in the sense that you see Greg do it or somebody like that. But, you know, we teach, you teach through a lot more than just go opening up your Bible and saying, let's sit down and have a Bible study. That's a number one way to do it. You know, hey, let's sit down. Let's talk about the Word of God. But you also teach people through your actions. And when it comes to people that you're trying to reach, one of the things that I have found just through life experience, uh, is that people generally do not care how much you know about the Bible until they know you care about them right here first. And that's a big deal to people. And so you you are reaching out and you are teaching in the way that Jesus did, in the way that Paul did. You're, you're becoming friends with people. You're showing them that you care about them. And ultimately, you're trying to get them to become a Christian. You know, Eventually, you want to lead them to those deep conversations. You know, that is funny that you mention what, you know, what could be out there. I think I might have a good idea from what the Bible teaches in the book of Genesis. And you can open doors that way. So Paul is saying all of us who have been taught the truth should be willing and wanting to, to reach out and help and teach others. That should be a goal of ours. Um, and again, it, that's intimidating to some people because a lot of times we think about knocking on doors. And we know how that goes nowadays, right? You knock on somebody's door and typically what happens? One of three things happens. <laughs> the last time I ever went door knocking... I, 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 I knocked on the door and you know, we were with the, we were with a group of people and I saw the blinds go like this. Then I saw them snap shut and I saw all the lights go off in the house. And I thought, <laughs> just roll this up and slide that there in the door. And then you have other people who get angry at you. What do you think? I need something. You, you, you think I'm not as good as anybody else. You think you're better than me? Well, no, you know, I mean, just, just right out of the gate, you know, defensive. And then there's the, you know, I'm going to be nice to you, but I really want you to get off my porch, people. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a place. Thanks, though. You know, and, and, and we, we appreciate that. And Isaiah preached his entire ministry and never reached anybody. You know, so, I mean, we have, we have you know, a, a really good example there. But we should want to share that. And we'll, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about why. And then... Paul gets into verses 7 and 8, and he gets back into that agricultural theme. You reap what you sow. In farming or gardening, this is an absolute principle. You absolutely will reap what you sow. And Paul wants us to know at least two aspects of this. First thing is, whatever you sow, you will reap. So if you sow tomato seeds, you're, going to get corn, or you're not going to get corn. <laughs> I don't know much about agriculture, but I do know that. If I, if I plant tomatoes, I'm not getting corn. If I plant apples, I'm not going to get peaches. You get what you sow. And no matter how bad you want it to be different, it won't be. If I sow sin, what I will ultimately reap from that is nothing righteous. And that's what he's trying to say. You can't live one life and expect to reap the other one. Jesus even talked about how you can't ride the fence. You can't have one foot in sin and one foot in the church, so to speak. It's impossible to do that. You can't serve two masters. And so Paul is saying in the same, in the same vein, but from an agricultural standpoint, you can't sow sin and reap righteousness. The two are not mutually exclusive to, or, 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 or to, to, to one another in that sense. Second is, though the seed may lie in the ground to no apparent effect for a long time, it will come up eventually. 
It's not reaping that determines the harvest. It's what you put in the ground in the first place. And a lot of people are, you know, go through life and they think, hey, I've been, I've been stealing from work for 30 years and they haven't caught me yet. <laughs> not me. Purely for example. You know, I've been cheating on my wife. Again, not me. I, you know, I've been, I've, I, I've been living this, this, this other life for, for decades and I've never gotten caught. The Bible assures you that one day, somehow, sooner or later, whatever it is that you are sowing, you will reap. It will catch up to you. The reaping determines the har- it's, it's not the reaping that determines the harvest. It's the sowing that determines the harvest. So whatever you sow, you reap. And sin always bears destruction. It never bears joy. It never brings about good. It may give you little glimpses or, or little tiny windows where you think, man, that was really enjoyable. But it doesn't bring about peace. It doesn't bring about love. It doesn't bring about joy. It doesn't bring about happiness. It may make you feel good in the moment or over the course of several weeks or maybe even a couple of years, but eventually it's going to break down on you. Eventually it's going to turn on you. And so it comes home to roost and you can't hold off the consequences forever. So what he's talking about is that if anyone rejects the gospel and lives completely to the flesh, seeking and serving something other than Christ as their savior, as their savior, they're going to reap eternal destruction. If it doesn't catch up with you here, even, even if you manage to skate by your entire life, and you, and, and, and you breathe your last breath saying, I know where that $33 million I stole from the bank is and I'll never tell a soul. It's going to come out in judgment. You're going you're gonna to have to stand before God. You will ultimately reap destruction rather than eternal life. And it's a stark warning. And it's a difficult warning because that's not a popular message, especially in a culture we live where people want to say, hey, I define what's true. I defy what define what's real for me. I get to choose the way I live and you don't have a right to tell me otherwise because it's none of your business. And your book doesn't have a right to tell me otherwise. Now, this, is, this, is a, this is a controversial thing and it's a stark warning. But the promise of this is just as wonderful as the warning is scary. To the one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit you will reap eternal life. So if you're striving after God, now, again, you may plant tomatoes, but does that mean you're going to plant them perfectly? Does that mean that you're going to water them at the exact right amount of water every single time? You're going to give them, you're going to, you're going to plant them and, and, and stake them just so the right amount of sunlight is hitting them? Well, probably not. You're going to make mistakes and you're going to mess up. And even though you are sowing spiritual things, you're a human being. And at some point in your life, You'll fail, you'll fall short, you'll do something wrong, you may hit a rough patch. I actually planted tomatoes last year and I didn't get a single red one. Now, I don't know what I did wrong, but I got green ones. And as I was waiting for those green ones to turn, I flipped one over and they were black and hollow on the inside. I sowed tomatoes, but what I reaped was corrupted. Now, unless you go so far off the beaten path that you corrupt everything in your life, you will ultimately reap tomatoes. Or- Spiritual things. <laughs> Jason, I'll tell you how to fix that. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to make me wait. Well, talk to you later. Too much calcium? Bottom. Was it too much too calcium? Much calcium. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's why it rots on the bottom. Oh, all right. All right. I thought maybe I overwatered them and then I gave them those little sticks that you put in there that feed them. And someone said too. Anyway, so you reap spiritual things if you sow spiritual things. And you're not going to do that perfectly. And that, the, the, the fact that you will not walk perfectly does not make you a bad person. It makes you human. And that's, and that's the great thing is we can all relate to that. If we live by the Spirit, we will enjoy the approval, the assurance, and the fulfillment, and the joy of the Christian life now. And we know that that will continue beyond death. There are blessings and reasons to be a Christian now. To, to walk spiritually now. Uh, and, and I mean, we can go, we can go through a whole, a whole list of them. I mean, you get the church, you get peace, you get joy, you get love, you get a family, you get, I mean, you get, there's so many blessings that you get. You get purpose and fulfillment in life that you never had before. And you know that it doesn't stop just because you, just because you leave this life. You know that you go to heaven. You know that you get that beyond this world. And so in verse nine, he continues this agricultural theme and he says, let us not grow weary of doing good. We will reap if we do not give up. When those tomatoes, and I'm going to use that tomato illustration again. When I, when I saw those black tomatoes, 
I gave up. I quit. And I ripped them. I remember I was like, stupid tomatoes. They make it look. I watched this Amazon show where they showed you how to do that. I'm ripping them down. I cut the stupid stock down. It was October. I was like, I'm not. If I haven't gotten a green one now, I planted them in April. I was like, I'm not getting one now. And I quit. I, <laughs> go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, if you sow right, it comes out right. If you mess up and you repent, you can save your vegetables. And if not, you there is no forgiveness. <laughs> that is that is so true. <laughs> um, but yeah, we <laughs> man, I, there's so many applications I want to make right now. But we have this we have this agricultural theme here going on, and Paul's saying, "Don't grow weary of this." And life will beat you down. It's, it's sometimes it's hard to continue to do the right thing. Sometimes it's hard to continue to push yourself into doing what you know is right as opposed to, why do I even bother anymore? Why do I care anymore? Why, why does it matter anymore? And the idea is you can't ever stop walking after the spirit. You can't ever stop sowing. You can't ever stop because then you won't reap the thing you want. And he's saying, don't give up. Don't grow tired. You gotta hang in there. You remember those 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 Rocky movies? I, every one of us watched the Rocky movies probably several times all the way through, right? How many times did he what did 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 everybody tell him just stay down? You're getting killed by this guy, and he just kept getting right back up. And sometimes he still lost anyway. So this is a terrible illustration, but <laughs> but he never quit. And if you've ever met somebody who never quit, I met a lady. She was in her 90s, and she got diagnosed with cancer. And they said, this is, this is probably going to be it. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's far enough along. And they said, but if you want to fight, we'll fight with you. And she said, well, I'm going to fight it. I mean, she's in her 90s. And, and I remember she came, she came in and she was talking to me. And, and she, said, she said, yeah, they, they think I'm crazy. You know, you know, somebody in my family said I lived a good life. And, and, I, you know, and, and, and this and that. She's like, but I've never been a quitter and I can't start now, even though something terrible and difficult like this has come up. She's like, you just don't quit. She's like, you can never quit. And she lived several more, in her 90s, lived several more years. It wasn't even cancer that got her. So, I mean, I mean, when you equate that in a spiritual sense, I mean, there is a lot of weight there. Because the devil is always going, why do you bother? Nobody cares. Nobody's responding. Nobody's, nobody's appreciative. Nobody's taking time. Nobody even knows you're doing it. So why do you bother? Who cares? And, and Paul is saying, God cares. Don't ever forget that God cares. And what you're doing matters. Even if it doesn't seem like it matters in the moment, Paul's saying, I promise you, you're reaping more than you could ever possibly imagine. It's a powerful thing he's doing. He gets into verse 10, though. And he says, and not only that, but whenever you have an opportunity and whenever it arises, let us do good for everyone, but especially those who are Christians. Now, this verse is one of those proof texts that has been used over the years to try and say the church has no business to in any way, shape or form, take money out of our treasury and help non-Christians. Have, have you ever heard this argument being used from Galatians 6.10 because it says do good especially especially to those of the household of faith. So that means that we, we, can't, we can't take money out of the treasury to pay somebody's electric bill that isn't a Christian. We can't, we can't help somebody. You know, and, and an entire doctrine gets built around this. And I think it was Roy Deaver um, who said, the idea that the church cannot take money from the treasury to buy milk for a hungry baby, but will instead use the same money to buy fertilizer for the church lawn is a doctrine of the devil. He's right, isn't he? I mean, it says do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. And so Paul is saying we have an obligation to sow, to reach out to the people who need it, and also to fortify and lift up our brothers and sisters. And, and, and we do need to be especially mindful of them as well. So it's, 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 it's interesting in that sense. And that's the same one. I reformatted it. Okay. And then you get into verse 11. And this is the final appeal he's been. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah. Oh, really? I mean, that, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah. Anybody can do good, can't they? But you have, to, you have to go above and beyond even that. Yeah. It's Christ. that. Moves. Yeah, that's a great point. Go, go ahead, Dick. Jason. Right. And, you know, if you think about it, 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 that does coincide with what Paul is doing here. 
Because if you apply that principle, Paul could be saying, hey, you know what? My feedback from you, I should be disappointed, right? Because I've taught you better than this. That's a, that's a good point you make. I, I, didn't, I didn't make that connection. That's an excellent point. Yeah, Absolutely agree. I've been out to eat with somebody who was from, from when, when we were in Tennessee, uh, we went out to eat with some folks from church and the one guy was just, he was just I, rude is the only way I can put it. You know, you're going to mess me up, you're going to mess up my order like you did last time. Yep. Yep. Where did you just come from? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I remember me and Stasia were sitting there and I was like, I was, you know, I wanted to be like, what do you do? What do you, what are you doing, man? You're joking, right? But he was serious, grumpy as ever. It's like a big old bear. <laughs> oh, those, those are excellent points. Go ahead, Bob. You've had your hand up forever. <laughs> no. All hardwired. I mean, we, if, if we're all made in the image of God and we all have that, that same hardwiring, our, our compasses are all turned towards the same place, generally speaking. Even if we don't, even if, even if the people doing it don't know, the guy who stops to help you fix your flat on the highway, you know. Yeah, you, you could say like, wow, he doesn't know it, but you know, he just, you know, God wanted him to do, it. you know what I mean, yeah. or whatever, because, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point too. Yeah, give, give God the glory for all that is good, I, uh, I, I think is my takeaway. So yeah, all right. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go on before anybody else has had a chance to speak up. See, he was sitting up front, and and, had, and poor guy had his hand up. <laughs> Don't let me run you over, I'm telling you. Okay. So Paul then in verse 11 says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. That's a really interesting statement really interesting statement like he's saying they know better and they're doing it anyway for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law oh that's another interesting statement this is a really great last section for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our lord jesus christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. It's another interesting statement. Man, there's so much in here to unpack. We could do a quarter just on this. We, we, we won't, though. No. Okay. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, or be with your spirits, brother. Amen. So Paul takes the pen from the scribe, seemingly, and he says, look, I'm writing to you now. And this is where some people have sort of trailed off and they said, you know, maybe this is indicative of his um, thorn in the flesh. It could be his, his bad eyesight. We don't know. But Paul is doing that for a reason. And what he's doing is, he's, as we've seen throughout this entire letter, that this isn't a, a deep theological treaty or treatise, right? Like, he, it's a letter from a man who deeply loves the people he's writing to. And there's been a lot of places where he takes these almost like emotional detours, and it seems like this is his last one, where, he's, where, where the scribe is writing, and he's like, you know what, I'll just do it myself. And he grabs it, and he's going to finish off this letter. And here's his last appeal, his last invitation to keep trusting the gospel for salvation and living it out day by day. And he says, I'm going to do this in my own hand. I'm going to write to you in my own hand. And Paul wants to convince them that real Christianity is a matter of inward change and not external observance, which is exactly what was going on with the Judaizing teachers. It's substantial, not superficial. And he focuses on the motives of the false teachers. They want to make a good impression outwardly. They want to appear to be something they're not. And, he's, and again, it's personal. He's already said that the preaching of the gospel is terribly offensive to the human heart. Now that's interesting. People find it insulting to be told that they're too weak and sinful to do anything to contribute to their own salvation. Again, the culture we live in, people find that insulting. The gospel is offensive to liberal-minded people who charge that the gospel is intolerant because it states that the only way to be saved is through the cross of Jesus Christ. Who do you think you are? Then on the other side of that, the conservative-minded people uh, take offense to it because it states that without the cross, good people, just like we're talking about, I'm really glad you guys brought that up, 
I was trying really hard not to smile because you were hitting on the very thing that, that, that Paul was going to get to. That good people are in just as much trouble as bad people. And there's a hierarchy, right, that, that the world has. And you can see it when you read books and talk to people. People in the world view the, the spiritual hierarchy kind of like this. First, there's God. And there's nothing better than God. But again, this is a worldly hierarchy. So then underneath of that is Jesus because, you know, Jesus is God's son. So it goes God, it goes Jesus. And then underneath of that, it's, so it's God, Jesus, and then angels because, you know, angels are in heaven and they're servants and they're out there doing stuff and flying around with their angel wings and whatnot and, and this and that. And then underneath of that, you've got the apostles and they're great, right? Because, you know, they were the guys who went out and did all the stuff that Jesus wanted them to do. So it's, you know, God, Jesus, angels, apostles apostles and then underneath of that you got the really good people right you know the people that without a doubt are going to be in heaven like the mother Teresa's and the gandhis and those people you know the really good spiritual people and then you got you know the jews because the jews were god's people and hey maybe they still are god's people i just talked to a guy recently a very good friend of mine um and we were talking he, he made the statement you know god's got a plan for the jews and i said he had a plan for the jews and he executed it through christ well, yeah, but does the Bible teach that? So, you know, we go through all the stuff in the Bible. And then, and, and, and then he comes away and he goes, well, it's like I still think God's got a plan for the Jews. So many people in the world think, hey, Judaism is still important. Jews, Jews are still God's chosen people. And now we enter the section where people start to sort of see themselves. Then you've got the church going people, the people who are there on Sundays, the people who pray and sing, the people like, like my sweet grandmother who never missed a service in her entire life she'll definitely be there in heaven i know she'll be in heaven and then a lot of people will see themselves there or they'll see themselves in this category yeah, maybe i should go on sunday but i don't go on sunday no at least not as often as i should go right you know but i'm still a good person you know, I, I don't hurt anyone. I don't do anything wrong. And what I really hope is that God remembers I'm a good person and that on the day that I, you know, reach those pearly gates that I'll have, I'll have done enough to get in, right? You know, I mean, you hear people saying these kind of things. So most people put themselves either in that category or that category. And then, then there's this category. They, the troublemakers, the prisoners, the, 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 the lawless people, the criminals, right? Now, we, I don't know about them. Maybe they will, maybe, they're, maybe they won't. I, I don't know if I can say. I don't know if any of us can say, right? I mean, I mean there's, there, there's bad people, and then there's really bad people. The murderers, the, 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 the horrible people that you have to lock them up and throw away the key, right? There's those people. And then there's the really, really bad people, the, the Adolf Hitlers of the world, the, the Joseph Stalins of the world, Teletubbies, right? <laughs> All these things. When, I was showing Rowan this earlier, and he goes, wait, Dad, Teletubbies aren't bad. They're just colorful. <laughs> it's, it's a joke, buddy. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but those are the ones there. I mean... All, all the joking aside, there, there's no way they're going to heaven. They're, they'll never be in heaven, right? I kid. Hitler, you know, you know, and maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. They don't know. They don't care. They just know they're bad and they're not going. Teletubbies again. Then there's the demons, right? There's no way demons are going. And then I, at the very bottom of the spectrum, as bad as it can get, is the devil himself, right? That's, that's the spectrum in the world's mind. That's the, 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 the A to Z of all of this. However, the biblical hierarchy is different because the biblical hierarchy is this, that Jesus Christ is Lord, Master, Savior, Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And all people are in one of two camps. You're either, you're, you're either outside of him or you are in him and you are his. That's everybody, right? You either belong to him or you don't. It doesn't matter what class of person you are. And that's what, and, and, and this is kind of what Paul's getting at. Because ultimately the, go, the gospel is offensive because the cross stands against every scheme of man-made or self-salvation that's out there. It stands against all of them. So the world used to, used to appreciate religion and morality and those sorts of things. It, it, generally, it was looked at as a good thing. But the world and culture that we live into today are offended by the cross. For one reason or another, it seems to be more offensive to anybody or to everybody than at any other point that you can think of. And so people who love the cross are inevitably persecuted because of it. 
people who defend it, people who stand up for it. And then, and then you see the divide and you see the fighting and you just see the things that are going on. Just the mere mention of, of the fact that Roe versus Wade might get overturned brought people out to the Supreme Court and there is violence happening. I, I mean, I mean you, see, you see it happening all around us. The cross by nature is offensive and the only, we can only grasp its beauty, its sweetness, its, its, its glory if we first grapple with its offense, if we first deal with the fact that it offends, because people have a really hard time sitting there looking at, 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 you know, I mean, we can go through the stories, you know, Noah and the ark, Moses, and, you know, you know, parting the Red Sea. We can go through all these, and people like those sorts of things. We like Job. We like David and Goliath. But what we don't like is we don't like looking at the Bible and, and, and saying, this book tells me that there's something fundamentally wrong with me that I outside of myself can't fix, and I have a problem with and that's where people seem to struggle with the Bible. And so it is offensive by nature. And if someone truly understands the cross, it's either the greatest thing that, that you've ever realized in your life and you can't help but run to it and fall at the feet of Christ and say, I'm yours, or you've got to get away from it. It's repugnant to me. It's so offensive, I've got to push it away. And if you haven't done one of those two things as a person, you're still grappling with it. You still haven't gotten it. You still don't understand it. Now, the false savior that the Judaizers are worshiping, Paul tells us, is approval. Uh, did I see a hand up? I'm sorry. If there was a hand up. Okay. What's going on under their legalistic teaching is that the only reason they're doing what they're doing is because Paul says they want to avoid being persecuted. They know what they're doing. They know better. And if they were like me, Paul says, they would be persecuted as well. They want to boast. They've gotten into religion for fame, for prestige, and for honor, and for all the worldliness, all, all, all the worldly things that it can give them. And Paul says their ministry, as he sees it in Matthew 4, 17 through 18, is a form of self-salvation and righteousness. Do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew 6? He says, when you give to the needy, don't do it so that you can be seen by others. If you do, you've got your salvation. When you pray, don't do like the hypocrites do and stand on the street corners and stand up and pray real loud so everybody can see because the people that do that have their reward. Paul is saying these guys have their reward. They don't care about you, churches of Galatia. They don't care about anything you're involved in other than using you to serve themselves. And as a result of this, for, for, for appearances and acceptance by the world, false teachers are offering a religion that mainly focuses on externals, circumcision, ceremonial law, rather than an internal change of your heart, your motives, of your, or your character. Paul's saying that's what makes it so different from the gospel. The gospel is inside out. The, the interchange of the heart leads to a new motivation for conduct. These guys are outside out. They're focusing on behavior. They're focused and never dealing with the heart. But it's superficial. Remember what Jesus said? You all are just like this cup. You polish up the outside of it to make it look real good, but inside it's filthy. You guys are like a tomb who the white walls on the outside are washed and nice and pearly and spotless. And inside you're full of bones, dead men's bones. Paul is tapping into this here. He's saying what they're doing is superficial. What they're doing is wrong. And ultimately, he says, the heart of your religion is what you boast in. The thing that brings you the joy, the thing that you fight for, the thing that you love, the thing that you'll die for, the thing that you'll spend your money on, the thing that you will just bend over backwards to take care of, he's, that's the thing you boast in. And Paul's saying the thing that you boast in is, is what your true religion is. And what is the reason that you think you're in a right relationship with God? Because of your works? Because of the works of, uh, of the law? Because of your own righteousness? The gospel, I think, can be well summarized by verse 14. Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And what he's saying is, I never boast. I don't take credit for my standing with God, but I do take boasting in the cross. For what Christ has done is now something I boast in. To boast is, is to have this joyous exalting, right? To, to lift something up and to have a high confidence in it. And to know that you're saved by Christ's work alone brings you this joyous boasting. To know that it didn't have anything to do with me because if it did, I'd still be in my sin. It didn't have anything to do with me because if it did, I would never be good enough. It didn't have anything to do with me because if it did, my blood's not good enough to save anybody, let alone myself. But Christ is. And that's why I don't have self-confidence, but I have Christ 
confidence. And he says that the world is dead to me. And he sums it up basically by saying, the gospel has changed me in such a way that the world is fundamentally dead. I don't need it anymore. I still live in it. I'm still a part of it, but I don't need it. It doesn't define me. It doesn't have me by the throat anymore. And then he says that there's a rule. Living by the gospel, a rule, it is a way of life or a foundation of everything. Anyone who sets the gospel as the rule of their life, he says, will find peace and mercy and they will be members of the Israel of God. Not, not physical Israel, but spiritual. Everything is spiritual here. You will be members of the church, is what he's saying. Israel that is in heaven. Christians, again, are Abraham's children. It goes all the way back to the promise. And he concludes verse 17 by pointing to the fact that I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What does he mean by that? Likely, the scars... He's, ta he's likely talking about the scars that he had from torture, from being imprisoned, from being beaten. These false teachers, these, the, these people who were going after these, uh, the, 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 the self-gratification, the self-righteousness, didn't have a scar to bear, most likely. And what's interesting about this is Paul is basically saying, I have the real marks of, apostol of apostolic authority. Not greatness, not riches, but signs of suffering and weakness. And every single one of us, to some degree, has scars that you carry with you. Paul's scars, he said, show that I am suffering for Christ. And yet at the same time, in, in, in a very broad sense, they were his scars. And in a very real sense, what Jesus did on the cross is he took your scars and your pain and your sin and your sadness and your doubt and your, your everything that just wasn't good enough. And he gives you his instead, which was. You bear his marks. You bear apostolic marks. Not in the same way that Paul is saying it, obviously. But we bear the marks of Christ. And we bear them for other people. And again, Paul signs off the letter in the same way he began it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. It's the beginning. It's the end. It's the thing that carries you through life. And it's the thing that you have waiting. God, grace is the entry point. It's the way we live. It's what leads us home. And it's what the world needs right now. And I love that song as we close. The, uh, the, um, in Christ Alone is, is, is kind of the current generation, and maybe not even the current generation. It's kind of becoming the, the other generation's amazing grace. Uh, we sang it a lot when I was at Freed Hardman. I think they sang it a lot at Harding as well. Um, of course, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know that, but there's a verse in that. It says, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I really think this is the vein that Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians, and it's what he's trying to get them to see. Anything that the world is calling you into isn't enough, but in Christ, Christ is enough.